will work as uh, as one teaching anymore it, it will just not work so uh, the new way of learning is gathering information uh, checking it with yourself with your body and putting it together as it fits exactly you and that will be the new style of learning for absolutely every topic and this topic being you know quite sensitive um, and difficult to discern for many reasons especially important to be guided and you know as many information as, as you can get you always check like uh, who who is speaking who is saying and uh, always check it with your own truth mm -hmm. there are super many false guides and false gurus in this space and that's partially why we want Pepe to be part of it because from our discernment we feel that he is a pure source one of the few mm -hmm. and that's why it probably mm -hmm. took us four years to even get to the topic in spite of uh, of uh, quite intense demand <laughs> from our group mm -hmm. but uh, it really took us four years to clearly see through uh, what is real and what is not <clears throat> mm -hmm. yeah so with all this uh, said we want to as usual uh, you know turn it to you guys and see what are your questions or experiences and maybe why have you been interested in this topic and how it has been for you so far? What about sexuality? What about sacred sexuality? Do you know the difference between the two? Do you just sense it? How has this been in your life? So if you have like a short one burning question about it, Let's hear it so that we can uh, guide this session according to what your interests are. You are always our guide and you are our, our teacher in a way with your questions and your uh, state where you are. So let's open it to you. So one most burning question when it comes to sacred sexuality. Yes, uh, Vicky. Yes, thank you. So yeah, this it has been a burning question for me for I think decades. Um, as as a Buddhist and someone with um, li living in a tradition for many 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 lifetimes, I always felt a kind of conflict, maybe not guilt, but a, but a serious conflict with it when it came to sexuality, and. Uh, and I, I I studied the not the new age but the but the classic uh, tantric um, uh, studies, the Buddhist studies, uh, which are quite elusive and not very elaborative. Um, and yes, my question is is this: how to how to live um, a, a healthy well, sexuality? Without guilt, that's a step up from the from the material one. Mm -hmm. that, that's yeah. beautiful question. Thank you, thank you, Vicky. Excellent. Yeah, I think many can relate because uh, what you're actually highlighting is this uh, <clears throat> for many for many of us, and especially I'll just uh, put a little side note. Uh, there are many of uh, women, and I know present here in the screen who carry very specific energetic codes, which are completely wired to purity. There's a power that lies within you, women, that only will activate in presence of a very pure energy and very pure masculine energy, very pure feminine energy. So we have to take this into consideration that we're not just individuals, we're also uh, carrying the seeds of the new existence within us. And that, encodes us with a drive for uh, for purity and aligned uh, and aligned expression so this um, what you are feeling is also part of it uh, you are unconsciously and consciously looking for the right setting you know if you have a seed you're looking for the you know fertile soil and the mm -hmm. right conditions okay we'll get into that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but absolutely 
Absolutely. We, yeah, great, great question. We will certainly cover it. Yes, some other questions or mm -hmm. like a burning topics when it comes to sacred sexuality. Yeah, so we also have David's. Yeah, David uh, asked the question how to protect yourself from external entities that may feed off Here from is that moment <laughs> of vulnerability. <clears throat> Ah, ah. <laughs> you made it. I made it. I'm sorry. Hey, brother. Beautiful to have you. I completely forgot it was Saturday today. <laughs> <laughs> We're living in timeless, in timeless mode. <laughs> well, yeah, absolutely. And this is exactly how we felt. We felt that, uh, you know, the, something higher is guiding us and uh, if you you will show up if you need to show up on this one so. i'm here i'm here i wouldn't miss it for anything oh beautiful <laughs> just trying to see where i'm going to be comfortable yeah i think uh, thank you for now what we are just doing we are going through everyone uh, and having this one burning question that they have about sacred sexuality and then we will turn it uh uh to you to give us your perspective and also a little bit uh, uh give an introduction of uh, what we are doing yeah uh -huh. mm -hmm. yes yeah so we had one beautiful question already now we go to bella uh we just didn't hear uh, uh david question till the end he says how to protect yourself from external entities they may feed off of the moment of vulnerability or authentic expression exactly we'll talk about that it's amazing question because when we engage in sexuality that's all we are opening to everything yeah so it's going to be a great uh, great question to talk about bella what's your question hey everyone good morning mm -hmm. um you finally have the topic that i wanted to have <laughs> for for yeah, ages, because it's been also like a very burning question for me. And I think throughout kind of uh, this journey of personal discovery and, uh, you know, spiritual growth, I think I've intuitively known that sexuality has had kind of a key place in that. And, but, you know, alongside I've been, you know, for, for my, my business where sexuality has a kind of a special role, kind of a centerpiece for, you know, at, 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 at Embody Wellness, right? I, I study all kinds of different body techniques. And then I realized how, um, you know, for, for health in general, how important uh, sex and sexuality are and, and how they're so completely sort of uh, still in the taboo zone and, and not really uh, brought to the center place where they should be, right? Um, but I also know that it's not in this kind of, you know, like set for you and it has like these benefits, like it, it, it can't be approached in that way either, right? And so it's just, I've been really studying from all these different traditions and the, kind of the history of it as well. And um, obviously it has a really long history of oppression and control and kind of being associated with the institution of, of, uh, of marriage, right? And it's like very had very strict definitions and kind of uh what are they called just you know a lot of things attached to to mm -hmm. the word sexuality to the concept of sexuality and then now we've come to really you know take those away slowly but then I think we, we lost something in the process obviously so it's in a way like where is that where is that equilibrium where is that middle ground right this is my my question but also um how is it related to, because, you know, is it, what's the association of sexuality and love, right? That's kind of a really big question that like, yes, is sacred, sacred sexuality necessarily associated with this, um, you know, with love or is it, is, or maybe the, the definition of love is incorrect uh, the way we have it. So yeah, that's kind of my, the question that I've never been able to answer so far so great. would love to hear from from you guys and from Pepe. Mm -hmm. great question okay. thank you bella amazing yeah so uh, so Pepe, we will collect the questions and and then you then you can expand i know you love wow. questions <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> <laughs> so let's hear from sheila and then luca okay 
So my first question is, uh, you said, Victor, about if we know what the difference is. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what is the difference. And the sacred sexuality, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. So that is my, you know, the first question. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking forward to listen more about it because it's also a um, taboo space mm -hmm. for me during some years and around. Mm -hmm. So it's not so opening. At the same time, I see it as a life, you know, life uh, energy also, but it's so hidden. So I'm looking forward to listen to this. So my question is like, what does that mean? Sacred sex sexuality. I can't even not say it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there is something going on here. I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah. So this is um, interesting. Yeah. Beautiful. Yes. Thanks so I'm open-minded. I want to be more open-minded. Mm. You know? mm. Yeah. So that's it. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you, Sheila. Uh, Luca, you are the next with the question, please. Yeah, um, I grew up in a in, in Catholic uh, Catholic uh, like um, family. Mm -hmm. So uh, when I was a kid, uh, the whole topic of sexuality was a bit um, uh, under the taboo. Um, but then later, I uh, I was. Uh, searching a lot about uh, about this topic so uh, I um, I tried out many different approaches for myself and after this uh, longer search my uh, impression is that um, it is not wise to um, to uh, neglect this uh, very strong um, expression of life energy but rather to, uh, but, it, but, but much better to, uh, to channel it. So not try to avoid it, but try to use it uh, in a proper way. And I think it's uh, very important in one's life. Um, if one has this, you know, like need or wish to bond with someone very, on a very profound, deep, deep level, I think it's, uh, it's, um, a great blessing to find someone with whom you can experience this um, this uh, complete union in uh, in in act of uh, sexuality, mm -hmm. and uh, this uh, this is certainly sacred. I think. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Loka. Absolutely wonderful to put the cat bring the Catholic background and the you know uh, there mind mapping when it comes to how you're uh, how you're you're allowed to use sexuality so we will definitely cover that as well um super powerful force so we will get into that oana saying still struggling to feel the sexual energy as sexual force sacred force as sacred force and use it for my highest purpose for creation how could i change that great question mm -hmm. one great goes question. along the lines with luca mm -hmm. yes yes um, and then Lisa, and welcome Lisa, we saw your struggles to join us, so yeah, beautiful to have you. Uh, what is the best crystal to use to transmit orgasmic power into, into? into if not, not utilizing the sacred sexual act, which should it be, if not to create a physical life? Okay, beautiful, it's about alchemical part of it, and how to store and uh, how to direct sexual energy. This is probably going to be the last part of our sharing. And, and she was not here to, to hear it because mm -hmm. she has a bad connection. So let's hear, thank you for the question, Lisa. Let's hear uh, Angela and then Uwe, and then I think we no, put it, give it to- Sylvia and- uh... Ah, yeah, Sylvia has a hand up. Yeah. Because- uh, at, so Angela, Uwe, and Sylvia, and then, and then we dive we, in. Okay. And then we dive in and uh, turn it to Pepe. <laughs> so Ange uh, Angela, Quite and you are muted, yeah? The, the question. 
Ah, I, yes. Okay. <laughs> so my question is how to um, connect the the lower parts, the material, the the more animal part of sexuality, uh, with the spiritual part. Hmm. Uh, most of uh, them, they make either or, but it has to come together. Mm, and what, from you all, what's what's the best way to to connect it and to combine, and how how you handle it with with your partner mm -hmm. when it comes from only the spiritual, more spiritual part, or more this more this um, material part, or I don't know how to mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Thanks, thank you, Angela. A beautiful question. Uh, this, how to reconcile the lower animalistic part that generates the energy from the higher part that is a more spiritual. Beautiful question. Thank yeah. you so much. Mm -hmm. Uwe. Yeah, um, that's actually a great one. Because uh, when I understood that um, sexuality is a basic need, and, and when I learned this, when it sunk in, so to say, it helped me a lot to to understand many things. And um, it, it was a healing in a way in itself. But I have more a general, uh, general question to the macro environment of uh, sexuality. Because I think, you know, like uh, religions like uh, Christianity, or I, I grew up in a, a Catholic country, for instance, so I think that sexuality there, um, as where I grew up, was like a taboo topic. So it's like you're not allowed to and and um, to talk about it, and and sex is uh, something uh, even bad uh, or or something like that. And I think you know, like there is no uh, sacred connotation to to sexuality whatsoever in in this. Um, in, at least in, in Austria, in this part where I grew up. Um, so it's like uh, everybody's doing it, but, you know, somehow, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think this macro view on, because when I travel, for instance, if I go to South America, I can feel that the energy is very, very different. Uh, like, you know, this tension between uh, male and female in, in, in different countries is absolutely different. And um, when I think about it, the only thing I came up with is uh, the background there is very different how they treat this uh, thought of sexuality and topic in general. And I'm interested into this um, yeah, constellation or into mm -hmm. this view, especially. Mm. Thank you. Beautiful. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Understood. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sylvia? Thank you, guys. Um, so I have been in a relationship 10 years and uh, have been kind of away from each other since last March. And um, so the sacredity of my relationship with Jeff has no question. Uh, so literally, I have been sexually fasting, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, which you, it 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 is an amazing process, and um, there's a lot into it, and I'm really feeling it that it energetically, spiritually, uh, does something like, just like fasting. So my question is that how can I really make the most out of it or how can we really make the most out of that phase as we are literally, it's like a purification process in, in many, many ways. And um, I had that in my life before, but I didn't think about it, that it can be also a gift. And I really would like to cherish it so that... Um, yeah, if you have any any practices or any anything that how to sexually fast in 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 the most uh, graceful way and the most um, sacred way. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you, Sylvia, for bringing purification. It is super important and step number one for everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wonderful question. And there are a couple more questions coming on the chat, 
how to practice sexual, uh, sacred sexuality in real life if the partner is not consciously involved in this. Mm, does it work if I'm the one implementing the sacred and on and or how would this affect him? Okay, that's from Eleonora and uh, from Anna Angie. How to attract and recognize the right partner for the right sexual union? Yeah, great questions. Well, so we have a, a uh -huh. beautiful variety. Anna Kocheva wanted, okay, one more question. Anna Kocheva, you always have beautiful, beautiful questions. Let's hear it. Thank you. Uh, that's a very quick one because uh, I totally agree to the people commenting on the Catholic upbringing, but then also like another influence that I noticed in my life is this um, crazy culture of like being over sexual, but without any deeper connection to the partner, meaning, you know, like um, my friends at the university would just collect partners and I, I could never really understand that because to me it was so important to actually connect also with the heart with people so i never understood this kind of and then at some point i just got so confused about it all you know it was like is it something wrong with me because i i am not able to open up my body to someone i don't feel any you know heart heartfelt connection with and basically my question in in addition to the question asked is also like how do i first reconnect with my own because i have it in me and my deep wish is to reconnect first with my own sacred sexuality and then hopefully attract the right person to leave it with. Absolutely, yes. Anna, thank you so much. And Fantastic. this is absolutely true. And it's amazing that you are already bringing it up like that. Beautiful. So uh, how do we go about, uh, maybe we give it to Pepe to, to give him his insights from here. Uh, the way that we are seeing it just in short is that first step would really be that we have to purify all of these conditionings that we have been almost like victims of through our lives and through difficult uh, from, from through different backgrounds through different churches different uh, family cultures and all this and once that this is purified then we can go further but uh, let's turn it over to Pep and uh, and uh, yeah, and, and, and Pepe, give a little word about your background and where your immense knowledge that we have privilege to know about where it comes from. Like, I open your. Can you hear me well? Yeah, we hear you great. Okay, uh, my background. Um, uh, was born in South America <laughs> and uh, in Uruguay, South America. And I had this uh, fantasy when I was very young that uh, I, was, I was reading a lot of science fiction and I had this fantasy about extraterrestrials and uh, this ongoing fantasy that uh, I was going to be abducted by extraterrestrials. <laughs> and one day, very young, I had this very deep realization uh, that changed my life. And it's a very silly little thing, but it did change my life. And the realization was, if I am truly abducted by extraterrestrials, I am representing humanity. <laughs> wow, what does it mean to be a proud human being? What does it mean for me to stand in front of an extraterrestrial and say, yeah, Check me out, I am a human being. You won't want to kill us after you meet me. <laughs> and that, in a way, started my whole path. And the question is what it is to be a whole human being, what it is to be a beautiful creation of this incredible mystery that, that the universe is, and, and what are our, our potentials. Uh, and so very young, I started reading all kinds of literature and uh, of course, I'm a child of the 60s, so experimenting with LSD and, 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 and drugs and blah, 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 and reading Zen and Sufi and trying to find the, you know, and this time in Uruguay, the books were very rare, right? So you vibe, you're going and researching and someone says, hey, check this book out until I did find a couple of books that 
also <laughs> one opened the door for me was uh, called introduction to Zen. And the one, the other one like kicked me out that open door, <laughs> which was the teachings of a man called Gurdjieff. And so I left my country when I was barely 20. And uh, I traveled for about 15 years uh, and studied uh, all kinds of crazy stuff, year long retreats, uh, years in India, years in Japan. Um, yeah, I, I don't want to go too long. <laughs> but it's been a very interesting life. Right now I'm speaking to you from Slovakia, where I somehow ended up in Slovakia in this little, little town. And uh, my background is mostly in Zen, Zen Buddhism. Uh, I am right now about to turn 66 years old, so I've had quite a good run of it. And, uh, and the whole Tantra thing, of course, was very fascinating for me. And uh, then when I went to Japan and uh, China, the, the Taoist approach really, really touched my heart. So that's, that's uh, very briefly my background. But if you want to talk about more specific stuff, maybe you can throw something at me and I can share my point of view. But, you know, before, before you, uh, we, we approach any specific question, and I was uh, speaking to you guys about this, uh, just want to make clear that I have, uh, I think it's relatively dangerous to take one thing out of context and start thinking and worrying about it. And, uh, and these things... Um, to give something importance, it brings it up from the general level and makes it into a stressful thing, yes. So I want to caution you uh, about that. Uh, I'm a musician too. So for instance, you know, if I'm playing my guitar in my sofa, uh, I play fantastic. I mean, it's, it's beautiful. My, my, my partner loves it. And then the other day I went to record and they press the red button and somehow I screwed up all over the place. Why? Because it's important, right? It's important. And so a level of stress comes, comes in. Sexuality can, can do that, right? It can, uh, if you start bringing it out from the whole and, and looking at it and thinking about it, uh, it can bring a, a, a unnatural stress to it. So my approach is, is very Taoist in a way that everything is equally important or non-important, everything. And so I don't like to take anything out of the context. And so sacred sexuality for me is not necessarily an issue. The issue for me is sacred life, sacred life. You cannot take something out of context and gonna make this sacred. And then, you know, you go to the supermarket and you get pissed off and, and you get impatient and then you're driving and, and you get road rage and, and, and then you go to the bedroom and what do you think is gonna be different? Uh, if we approach life as a holistic um, thing, then the question is, is life sacred to you? Do you feel the sacredness of every breath you take? And what steps are you taking in your life to sacred lies? I, I was, uh, uh, for me, it was very interesting because I, I actually looked once the word sacred in, uh, in an etymological dictionary and said to make sacred. It was interesting because it was all about a verb. And for me, that made total sense to me because it's a choice. It's really a choice. Ultimately, we know nothing, okay? We got to start from there. The, the universe is this amazing mystery and, and to pretend that we know something is like trying to put the ocean in a little bottle of wine. And so my Zen master uh, always, uh, he was Korean and, and he would always say, only don't know, only don't know, 
<laughs> and that really just like burned into my <laughs> psyche. You know, if we start from the I don't know, then we are open minded, we're curious, we are eternal students, and there's a joy. The moment you say I know, you close the door and, and you cannot learn anymore. So in this only don't know, um, we have a question to live as if. To live as if, you know, this, this, this matter of God, very dangerous, uh, very dangerous word, but we live as if there is, or we live as if there is not, it's your choice. Now, I live as if the universe is a form of consciousness, and I am this very teeny weeny, but very important part of it. Just like, you know, sometimes I ask my students, you know, is this Pepe? <laughs> is this Pepe here? Well, what is the answer to that? Yes and no, right? Because this is just a little part of Pepe, but if something happens to it, Pepe will be affected by it. So it is and it is not in every cell in my body is Pepe. Therefore, you are it in the same context of the universe, right? You are this beautiful cell of the universe that contains all the DNA information of the whole universe, and you're connected. And so for me, the, the trick has been to find practices that bring me to that awareness of total connectedness, and that connectedness is so immense and mysterious and beautiful and joyful uh, that gave me a, a true uh, understanding, or I, I love the word realization, real, realization, i.e. to make things real on a physical, emotional, mental level, and this gave me the realization of what to me is sacredness, to be a part of this incredible mystery that, that the universe is. And that naturally goes into every part of my life. It makes no difference whether I'm cutting an onion or going to the bathroom or, or going to the supermarket or making love to my partner. It's so this unity of, of absolute mystery and bliss and joy and, and, uh, and every breath you take, every breath you take is a gift of the universe. Every breath you take is the most incredible chemistry that the whole universe is creating in order for you to stay alive. One thing changes, a few, a few, degrees up and we all die you know a, a little more or less oxygen and we are gone we are completely interdependent with the whole universe and it's a beautiful dance of of life and so that's the one thing that i really want to uh, emphasize be careful with taking something out of context and and looking at that and sexuality and and why and and how and, and look more at your entire life. You know, what's your relationship with your plant? What's your relationship with the employee in the bank? Uh, mm -hmm. How much love do you carry in your heart for the, the totality of this beautiful thing that we call creation? And so that will naturally go into, into the bedroom. So, I want to start with that uh, because that for me is kind of the most important. And how do I approach that is, is by having a practice, uh, whatever it is. You know, I've studied yoga, qigong, blah, 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 blah. And there are certain practices that attract to me and I have kind of a toolkit of practices. And every day, whether it's three minutes or two hours, I plant that, you know? Just I, 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 I water that, that plant of awareness, of gratitude, of, of joy, and uh, better three minutes than nothing at all, right? Better three minutes every day than five hours on Fridays or Sunday mornings. Mm -hmm. uh, every day, just like water, water that plant, with any kind of practice, whether 
any kind of practice, whatever it could be running, it can be doing weights, but the intention is what matters. See, that's, that's the other thing that for me is very important is never the what, but it's the how that you, that you do it. If you're always planting that intention of growing your awareness, of growing your love, the what is not that important. You can do yoga, you can do qigong, you can do meditation. There's endless traditions and techniques and, and uh, you go to YouTube and you learn something and then you go to another video and they say, no, don't do that, do this, it's much better. And don't waste it out. No, 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 that's crazy making stuff. What you wanna do is what resonates with you and what really matters is how you do it. You, the amount of presence you put into it, the intention behind it, mm -hmm. anything will do. So Pepe, with this uh, background and with this kind of holistic approach to life and all this, yeah, uh, absolutely super important to uh, approach everything from as oneness. And then if we would have to then answer some of these questions, especially the ones that are this like what is like this state of sexuality now versus how it could be what would you say to that how it could be versus that you know what is happening now and how uh, what is in people's what is happened in everybody's mind because of the culture that they are being immersed in mm -hmm. so something like that non-conscious versus conscious sexuality you know yes The first thing that I would say is to really be loving and forgiving and non-judgmental with yourself. We are, you know, I am stuck with Pepe <laughs> and Pepe has a history and, and uh, that history is part of, of my being and all the conditioning that I got from my culture is in me. And so how can I do the best with what I got? How can this Pepe thing serve uh, a higher a higher purpose? And the first thing for me, of course, as you can see by the language I use, is to, to realize that me and Pepe is a relationship. Me, I, is a mystery. I don't know who is, who is talking. But this Pepe thing is a thing, and there's a relationship there. And I can, I can look at, at the body and realize that I have a relationship with the body. And for me, that's a very healthy way of, of living because if we say me, 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 we, we tend not to uh, be very loving with ourselves. Uh, but if we approach it with, as a relationship, then we can be more aware and more caring. What is my relationship with my body? What is my relationship with this Pepe thing? Because think about it, if you, uh, the language that, that we use really conditions us, right? And, and we are constantly saying my, and we can go through our entire being, my spirit, my soul, my body, my emotions, my mind, and, and eliminate everything and what do we are left with uh who who is saying my <laughs> who, who is saying my and that's the great mystery that's the great i amness and that little thing that is there's no question that it is you know you are but you are a great mystery and so that beautiful seed of creation that you are is relating in an aware way with all the parts of your being. And when you have a relationship, then you can apply awareness. Like I relate to my body with great love and gratitude and respect. And so in Taoism, for instance, there's a, there's a practice called the inner smile. You just close your eyes and you feel the smile and you let that smile just go down and say thank you to all your organs and your bones and your blood and psychologically that's like like literally like a bath like an inner bath it just like lightens you up and establishes this relationship right and so that's where we start that we have to start with the body and the body has been demonized right by by many philosophies and, and religions and we want to 
punish the body and, and hit ourselves and, and deny our sexuality. And uh, even on a logical and historical point standpoint, we know that that, <laughs> that just leads to deviations and cruelty and, and uh, don't need to go into that, right? The, the, the story of, of uh, what religion has done in our life is, is, uh, is history of cruelty. And mm -hmm. yeah, the, the, we start with the body and, and we treat the body as a miraculous creation of the great mystery of the universe. And, and we love and we whatever whatever practice or whatever diet but i think the, the the key for me personally has been to really hone into my body wisdom and i've i've done it through yoga yoga has really uh, put me in 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 connection with my body wisdom in a way that my body literally speaks to me so i don't need any diet i have diet books i'm in front of a any kind of food and my body will say yes or no very clearly. And it changes, you know, sometimes a, a plate of French fries, the body goes like, yeah, let's have a good time, you know? And sometimes it's like, no, don't touch that. Because the body really has a lot of wisdom. And so number one, love, respect, cultivate your body awareness and be grateful for this vehicle that you have for this uh, incarnation of yours you are beautiful you are a miracle of of life just if you even study a little bit the conditions necessary for us to be alive in, in tibetan buddhism uh, they use a, a beautiful image they say if there was a, a little circle floating in the ocean, a hoop floating in the ocean, and only one turtle existed in the ocean, and the turtle comes up to the surface once a year, the chances of that turtle coming up and putting her head through the hoop, that is how incredibly miraculous to have a human body is. And so that's number one is to have that appreciation. And the sacredness comes from appreciation and awareness. You cannot grab this thing called sacredness and figure out, okay, I'm going to make this. It, it, it's, an, it, it's a heart-centered thing that, that has to come from, from a place. The, the greatest energy is gratitude, gratitude and, and awareness. These things need to come organically in a natural way. And so we have to start out on the roots and, and the root is awareness and gratitude because you cannot not be gra grateful if you truly are aware of the miracle of being given this uh, incarnation. Mm -hmm. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This makes so much sense. But actually what I wanted to maybe uh, raise the question where these uh, questions are, are actually leading a little bit is, uh, you know, uh, you say we have to hone to the body and actually start feeling it. But what ends up happening for most people is that they are not at all aware of what's happening in their bodies and they don't really have that connection. And if they do, they have it associated to the trauma and wrong associations with what these body sensations are that are connecting to whatever their Catholic upbringing or, you know, Muslim upbringing or whichever, you know, whatever has tied guilt to the body sensations or whatever other misalignment, you know, over sexualized society. So wherever I look, I see sex. So I have like an erection when I look at the food commercial, for example. Those are like huge and alignments that are happening because we are immersed in the culture that is uh, us, uh, doing the wrong associations. So that we cannot really hone that purity that you, for example, have to say, okay, today is the right thing to eat french fries. Tomorrow it's not because you trust your body. But uh, for most of us, uh, the conditioning has been so strong that we cannot trust our body. What our body says is wrong. 
It says, yeah, wow. you can eat this uh, French fries, but it's wrong. You can't really. But this is an addiction from before. And same for sexuality. Some people asked how to know with whom, you know, they can even engage in some sort of really clear interaction. So th this is the question here. How do we trust and how do we purify to the level that we can trust the body? What would you say? Choose a practice and cultivate that that practice and and observe the things that are. Uh, I, I have a very serious uh, attitude towards, a, you know, what I would call a, a relative state of freedom. If I notice I my well being starts really depending on something external, I eliminate it immediately. I like I. You know, I'm a Latino, right? So we don't say let's get together. We say let's have coffee. That's what we say. And so one day I realized that, you know, this coffee thing, I was becoming, or I was truly a slave of it. For 15 years, I didn't touch coffee. I also love a glass, a nice glass of wine at night. And I realized, wait a minute, one day I don't have wine and, and I feel bad. It's like, no, didn't touch wine for 10 years. And so, and then slowly one day I was walking by a coffee shop and ah, I smell the coffee and I go to my body, can we, are, are we free from it? And the body went like, yeah, but only one a day. I said, okay. So now I have my coffee one a day, but when I don't, I'm in a retreat center or something, it makes no difference at all. So to really observe the things that externally are, are conditioning your well being and really become, to a certain degree, have mastery, uh, have mastery of that. As far as the sexual energies is the same thing. You want to hone on the things that are affecting your life and find techniques or, or activities that will allow you to bring some mastery of it. So for instance, what I did this it's a confession, <laughs> but since we are here in this beautiful space, I will tell you what I did. But I, for a while, I, I was uh, studying the Taoist techniques and I really wanted to master this energy. So I, I looked for, for some kind of erotic porn thing that really would, because porn really turns me off. I, I, I find it off-putting. But I found something that was beautifully erotic porn that actually turned me on and I let my body get turned on. And then I, I applied all these practices to literally kill my erection, you know. And so I, I was actually managed by will, to, by, by the force of a beautiful technique that is ancient to master this to master this energy so i would let myself be fully turned on and then apply this te technique and just like poof, teach myself to bring this energy up the the taoist uh, tradition has the most powerful techniques uh, for this but also in tantra etc cetera, etc cetera. and so i even psychologically i i really felt empowered by this right and then to apply it in 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 my sexual actual sexual life was so beautiful so so beautiful and when when you become more expansive uh, in in this sexual you go to what in Taoism is called the valley valley orgasm as opposed to what is called the peak orgasm and the valley orgasm is just like a state of you know for me this word is fundamental gratitude <laughs> somebody is sharing their body with you you know and these bodies are beautiful creations and so you, you come to this tantric idea of shiva shakti we, we are gods and goddesses and, and this incredible connection and to learn how to um, move energy and share energy uh, also in the taoist tradition you you have ways of moving energy and leading energy to specific places in your body or, or move them upward, et cetera, et cetera, and to cultivate energy. And um, so, you know, to not go on and on and on, you, you create a, an intention, you create a level of awareness around a, 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 a specific area in your life and you find a technique 
And like I say, the technique is not that important. There isn't the right technique, the wrong technique. It's simply the technique that speaks to you and that you put intention in it and that you cultivate every day. So that cultivation will definitely give you results. It'll give you results. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, here, my beloved is making me tea that I didn't have time to. So I'll introduce you uh, to my Kevin. my beloved. So yeah, that's that's what I would say. Uh, mm -hmm. For me, the the practice is really important. For me, meditation is fundamental. You know, to to really uh, allow me to go in and and find this expansive uh, state that in Buddhism is called shunyata or emptiness. You know, and and. It allows you to take a vacation from yourself, you know. <laughs> this this Pepe thing sometimes is tiresome. So I take a vacation from Pepe-ness <laughs> and expand myself into what I the I am truly is, you know. Like this is Pepe, right? And so this little finger can actually expand its awareness and go into the whole body, connect to the whole body, and go like, wow. So there's beautiful techniques that allow you to realize this thing. And then what is not sacred? What isn't sacred? You cannot take something and say, this is sacred and this is not sacred. This is God and this is the devil. What is that? That duality is, is so childish, you know, so childish. Every breath you take is sacred. And when you take that sacredness to the bedroom, you, you can't fail because you you are realizing that that state and you are embodying that state so you can be an animal you're a sacred animal <laughs> be an animal <laughs> enjoy that mm -hmm. you can be a god a goddess yes you are yes you are embody that with trust and with dignity and with beauty and when you bring that energy to the bedroom how can you go wrong <laughs> Yeah. So the, thank you, Pepe. So the the question actually here, it's really really cool that you are mentioning that the animal can also be sacred, sacred Absolutely. animal. What we are kind of trying to discern here is that too many people are in the current state of uh, conditioning are actually acting, uh, engaging in sexuality in an animalistic way. When we say as an animal, what we mean is unconscious. We mean that they have been really uh, energized by lust and they have then been uh, in they have engaged in really connection body to body they are really turned on by the body and it ends in just what we can call a friction and it doesn't really go any farther than that so what we are looking to do we understand that sexuality is almost our power plant this is almost like our you know highest way to produce amazing amounts of energy and through alchemy we are you know we, we know that we can direct that energy to the practical outcomes in our life providing that it has been made to be pure providing that we have not really created an energy that is empowering something that is not completely pure so the question is the purification how do we actually purify from where our sexuality is right now? For example, you know, having the sexual encounter with your partner and all of a sudden remembering the commercial that you have seen or for people who are attached to pornography, you know, all of a sudden reenacting the pornographic acts that they have seen or, you know, whatever other defilements are in our field that would completely distract that energy so oh julia hey beautiful to see you so the purification is the first question that we have and this is something that we want to build in our course that we are making we want first to purify that one whatever we amplify with disengagement in when we say sacred sexuality what what we have meant by that word is that it is conscious sexuality so if it's unconscious, then we actually kind of are attracted to whatever turned us on and we engage body to body. So if we have something more than just this, then we call it conscious. So 
how do we purify from that old conditioning? For example, for those from Catholic uh, background, how do they dissociate sense of guilt from sense of actually, how can they even ever be free in, in the sexual context if I'm feeling already remain, uh, remains of the guilt that uh, my upbringing has attached to this to me? We, we know why it happened, but the question of purification is super important. So do you have something to share with us about how to purify those old conditionings before we even get into moving energies, because if not, we're going to move. We're going to move and amplify an alignments that we carry inside. You know. Well, uh, the first thing I would say to that is that the moment you use the word pure or purifying, you're bringing the impurity in inevitably, right? Uh, from a Taoistic point of view, those are very uh, dangerous ways of approaching things because if you really uh, emphasize the word purity then impurity seeps in immediately you're you're inviting the opposite always and so the first thing is to eliminate <laughs> the word purity <laughs> and realize that there is nothing impure in any mode of sexuality that is consensual if it's consensual, it's perfectly fine. Whether you're two animals uh, using each other's body and that's your level, fine, enjoy that. You know, the, the, the key here is to cultivate awareness. Awareness is a very magical ray of light that simply non-judgmentally illuminates what is toxic and what is non-toxic. Non and so, to apply non-judgmental awareness means to cultivate in, in whichever way uh, suits you to cultivate your awareness. There's only so much toxic behavior that we can indulge in once we bring awareness. <laughs> you know, we, we don't need to judge it. We don't need to do anything. Just keep shining that, that awareness into it. And so that's where meditation comes in from me. It's just a way of just giving water to this plant of awareness that keeps growing. And how, how can you hurt another human being in awareness? You have to be completely asleep to, to really hurt another human being, to hurt any living, any living creature. And so Again, instead of taking something specific and working on that, oh, what do I do with my sexual energy and blah, 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 just sit and cultivate awareness. There is nothing impure in anything except up here. Any adjective, in fact, it's only up here, right? Adjectives are human. Eliminate all adjectives. Yes, things are what they are. And, and we cultivate awareness daily in some way, and we apply it to, to our life. As well as applying self-love and non-judgmental compassion to ourselves and to others. And realizing also, you know, very dangerous. We have so much knowledge nowadays, so much knowledge, so much... Uh, access to Google and YouTube and teachers and, and books. And so what that creates is a, a level where our beingness and our knowledge are in completely different levels. And the important thing is to bring these two in alignment, right? But the more knowledge we have, the more out of tune we are, we are with our being. And then we have this knowledge concept of what a pure person should be doing what a yogi should be doing what a good person and and our beingness is not in that level and we create an internal war and so less knowledge and more beingness and beingness is is take a walk in the forest sit sit and sit and meditate be a moment with your beloved, you know, and, and also every, every interaction is an opportunity for awareness and beingness, every interaction you have. And so 
again, the holistic approach rather than taking this apart, but eliminate the adjectives. <laughs> Kill purity. <laughs> Kill purity. <laughs> Here's another question then that's not about purity, but uh, how can we release? It comes from Julie from France. How could we release our fears about sexuality? Because what comes attached to it is also fears from before, whatever those fears may be. Ah, fear. Yeah. You know, the, the amount of fear in, in your life is, is inversely proportional to your capacity to live and, and love. And so there's three different kinds of fear, though. Uh, there, there's this fear of the mind. Usually the fear of the mind relates to the future. The fear of the heart usually relates to the past traumas that, that you've accumulated. And there's a fear of the body. And the fear of the body is something very important because the body is in the moment and, and uh, we, we have to respect that. If, if your body all of a sudden tends to up, you better check out what's happening around you. But the fear of the heart and the fear of the mind are imaginary uh, because the past is gone and the future is not yet. But, you know, I had a teacher that, that uh, really blew my mind once because uh, he said we we would uh, we did a whole year long retreat with this teacher and one day he said you know now you realize how important this work is and you trust me completely and anything I'll ask you you give me but there's one thing you won't give up I would take it from you but you just love it you won't give it up and we all go like question right okay what is the revelation is coming right <laughs> and he says your pain you just love your pain. It's like, what? You know, it took me years to realize the importance of that, uh, of that uh, argument. How we build, a, we build an identity out of our own pain. I'm a survivor of this. I went through this, blah, blah, blah. Living in Israel for many years, you can see how an entire culture has made this identity out of pain. And this is that's what brings them together. And their rituals are about that. And their sense of self is about that. And so we're stuck with this incredible baggage, you know. And that, that brings fear. And fear is our limit. Fear is our limit. There was another crazy monk, an Irish monk that I lived with in, a, in Sri Lanka in a monastery, and he would attack me with questions. And it was a lot of fun. He was a very crazy guy. And one day he says, what is the sign of enlightenment? Give me the sign of enlightenment. What is it? What is the first thing, the most important thing? And so me being this long hair hippie, I go, love. He pretty much slapped me. <laughs> no. <laughs> he go like, so what is it? And he says, Fearlessness, fearlessness. Okay, another question mark, right? That took years to realize in, my, in myself. Yes, because once you, be, once you be, become and once you realize, what is there to fear? You know, it's, it's life, it's only life. And you know what, what, what really brings the fears is the adjectives. <laughs> <laughs> this is good this is bad this, this is no no it's life it's the ups and the downs are life and you're going to be good and you're going to be bad and you're going to be joyful and you're going to be suffering and it's all the gift of every moment it's all life and so um, listen to your fear but don't give it power just don't give it power. The awareness is very important, right? We cannot put it under the rug. We cannot fight it. We cannot deny it. Awareness. Bring awareness. Yeah, you're a woman and, and Paul screws you up and breaks your heart. And then you meet John and you tell John you cannot love him because Paul broke your heart. It's like, what? What does poor John have to do with Paul? Maybe John is the greatest guy you ever met. But now you have all these barriers around you, right? Awareness, awareness, open-heartedness, the only don't know. <laughs> and so curiosity and courage. 
courage to live. I mean, there was this beautiful Sufi story of the gardener, right, that had this beautiful garden and a storm comes and destroys the garden. So he builds a wall and then the rain comes and again destroys and finally completely covers his garden. And of course the garden dies because the storms and the rains are as important as the, as the sunshine. So my friends, go through your storms and through your rains and through your pains and, uh, and don't build any walls. You're powerful beings. You're, you're, you're parts of this beautiful, amazing creation. You're gods and goddesses. Have this attitude in life. Bring it on. I'm here. I'm Shiva. I'm Shakti. <laughs> I can do this. All of you, you know, I see mostly in my screen, I see mostly fairly uh, mature people. So uh, all of us have, have gone through really hard times, haven't we? And all of us are here smiling. So what does that tell you? Mm -hmm. You're a survivor. You're strong. You're beautiful. You are God. You are goddess. Mm -hmm. Embody that. Embody that. And screw fear. Screw fear. Respect it and, 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 and bring awareness to it, but, but don't let it condition the way you live, yeah? Well, that's a recipe for life, Beppe, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we are beyond, uh, you know, these series of teas are called Beyond Teas. Well, you went beyond topic, beyond tea. <laughs> beyond fear. And beyond fear, you just brought the formula for, for, for life. <laughs> <laughs> Just look at it, respect it, and then go on. <laughs> <laughs> awareness, awareness, awareness. Yes. And whatever cultivates your awareness, put a, a, a drop of water every day, you know? Yeah. Here's a question coming yeah, from... Yeah, I, I realize, yeah. you know, I, you know, your words are, are, are dropping like a nectar in my soul. Mm -hmm. I, I imagine that, you know, we really need, for what you're saying, Pepe, we really need the, eye, the ears to hear. Our beautiful group here has cultivated their ears to be open to this level of information. Um, <laughs> still, there is this uh, uh, these questions about, you know, how to meet the practicality because for for some it stays like beautiful and impossible concepts because you know we know you have had forty years of journey to come to this simple uh, attitude to life and mm. so complexity to simplicity. Um, so those who, who are still having the complexity issues, uh, the question is, so how do you actively practice this in an environment that's not uh, ideal? Yeah, how Anna says, ideally, idealistic environment. Uh, if you're not in kind of supportive environment, so is it actually the greatest gift to be in that uh, non-supportive environment or... Um, what would you say how to practice uh, this acceptance of life in yeah. any kind of situation? The greatest gift is whatever is happening to you in this moment. That's the greatest <laughs> gift. <laughs> my, my, my key question, when, when things, particularly when things get tough, my key question is like, what is the opportunity here? You know, once uh, Vancouver is, is a very safe city and once I was walking down, uh, going towards a concert and these three punks were coming the opposite way. And when they passed me, I don't know what they did. They, they, uh, they hit me and uh, for fun. And I woke up in a, in, in a lake of blood in the middle of the street and I went to the venue where I was gonna play and I saw the horror in people's eyes my whole face was destroyed. They destroyed my face. It was just meat. Uh, it took me months to, to recuperate from that. So this is what got me through that. What is the opportunity here? Okay, wow, wonderful opportunity <laughs> to really practice on my self-healing. I cannot work, I cannot do anything. So I have to go into complete retreat. I have to work on my anger. I have to work on my forgiveness. I remember those, it took me over three months to, to, to be human again and, and go out into the street without horrifying people. I, I remember it as a really wonderful time, wonderful time, you know? And they, they wanted to, to uh, turn me, take me to surgery and put metal because all my bones were broken in my face. I go like, no, you know, I don't wanna, I, I travel a lot. I don't wanna set every alarm in every airport with all my metal in my face out. And so I went into a journey of self-healing 
And when I went to the, to the doctor, I said like, wow, your, your bones have eaten so well, what are you doing? Well, what was I doing? Nothing at all. I was just letting my body heal itself through quiet meditation and through working on, on, on you know, really recognizing my anger and, and working on forgiveness and meditating. So I invite you to, to, uh, to uh, remember that whatever is happening in your life, what's the opportunity there? There is an opportunity there. There is, a, there, you know, remember the yin yang sign? In the black part, there is a white dot. And in the white dot part, there is a black dot. That's called the secret spot. Find, when you're in the dark side of the yin yang, find the white dot and cultivate the white dot. And the white dot grows into the black dot and the, and the black grows into the white. And that's how life always flows, right? So if we accept that flow and we eliminate adjectives, <laughs> It is what it is in the moment. What is the opportunity there? And so as far as your question, original question goes, the answer is simply simplify, simplify. Remember this thing we're talking about beingness and knowledge. You know, bring, bring the line of knowledge down, choose one technique, choose one teaching and practice it with simplicity, with humility and with joy and, and with gratitude. And water that plant every day, simplify, simplify as much as you can. And this is a great opportunity, right? The, this COVID situation, we have to simplify. We have to eliminate a lot of the normal activities. It's like, what is the opportunity here? Wow, golden opportunity, right? Yes, so simplify and work on beingness rather than knowledge. What is the secret mantra? What is the best teaching? What is the next book? That's not gonna take you anywhere, right? Just choose one thing, do it. Do it a little bit every day. And if you don't do it, don't judge yourself. It's okay, you know, have the French fries instead of yoga. It's okay, enjoy the French fries. <laughs> but they, if, if your intent uh, is, is strong enough, then you find a, a, a rhythm. Then you find a rhythm to connect with this uh, awareness. Yeah. Mm. So the one word that I would say is simplify. Another question. That, thank you, Pepe. There is the other. Wow, you you guys are so beautiful. So cool to see you. Mm. <laughs> I had to wait sixty years to find this this goddess. <laughs> <laughs> so be patient <laughs> well actually no, this is the question, question that yeah. was coming up how to attract and recognize the right partner for divine divine uh, sexual union or divine union how to attract and recognize the right partner that's what they are that's the, the question is only don't know <laughs> <laughs> just be cultivating your your own love for yourself uh, and that's all you do cultivate your love for yourself and cultivate your self-awareness and your self-care and become the god and goddess you are and then trust life trust life my teacher also had a very beautiful concept he called it the magnetic center and the magnetic center is, is means and it has also strong Taoist resonance right when you're in tune, we, let's say we have three systems, the physical, the emotional, and the mental. And those systems are hardly ever, hardly ever in alignment in most human beings in this modern society. Your mind is somewhere, your heart is doing its own thing, your body is all screwed up and you don't pay attention to it, eating the wrong foods, breathing improperly. When you come, through any given practice into this alignment, body, heart, and mind, you create what is called a magnetic center. This magic starts happening naturally. You start attracting the right thing at the right time, and you start being in the right place at the right time, and all these synchronicities start happening. And all you have to do is trust. Just trust. Trust unconditionally yourself, and unconditionally, you know, I don't call it God, I call it life. You know, scientists nowadays have a very nice uh, word for it. It's quantum scientists call it the field. 
yeah, it's a field of, of chromosomes and atoms, and we're just part of this field. And we are when we're in alignment, every step we take goes in the right direction. So end of the story, you know, you just be yourself and you will attract the right person at the right time. But remember what I said about importance? If you bring this subject out and you make it important, when will I find her? Where will I find him? Why don't I? Ah, now you have a problem. Now you have a, a source of stress, right? Now take a bath and love yourself. What will come will come and what won't come won't come. <laughs> it's very simple. <laughs> Mm. So that maybe answers also Anna's question, uh, does union happen first within and, and then it manifests outside, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. <laughs> and, and, then, and then Pepe, how about this uh, fasting uh, when uh, due to the current situation of impossibility to travel, partners are staying apart. So they're still having lots of love, but uh, literally no body connection is possible. So uh, that's Sylvia's question about uh, fasting from body connection. So how to make uh, the best use, to, use of it? What is the opportunity? That's, that's, my answer will be different than, than your answer. Um, but the important thing is, is to have our sense of alignment and, and self-love so, so we can nurture ourselves no matter what the outward circumstances are, you know. I mean, this this creature I adore, and I'm very uh, non-judgmentally attached to her. <laughs> but once in a while, given who she is, she has to take off. She has to take off, you know. <laughs> and so, I am unhappy about that. But what is the opportunity? You know, what is the opportunity? So I'm a musician. You know, I, I do my practice. I do my yoga. And I find that I can have a great time on my own. I can, you know, and, and that allows me to, to, to embrace who she is as she is. And it allows me to have an incredible gratitude when she returns. And it allows me to have a good life, whether she's here or not. You know, this, this uh, very twisted concept of love that, that we have, I need you. I would die without you. That turns into a, a very unhealthy prison, right? Because if I need you and I can't live without you, I'm making you my prisoner, right? And so it's a beautiful thing to say, I love you, <laughs> but I am okay with myself. I'm okay by myself. I, I need you because I love you. I don't love you because I need you. <laughs> and so, uh, Alignment, look for your alignment. When you're in, in, in alignment in, in any practice that, that brings you there, will, will, you will be okay. And the outward circumstances, will, they will affect us, right? We're not super men, super women. But what is the opportunity? What, 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 uh, how can we use this moment to, to create more awareness, to create more alignment? And we cannot deny what's happening right because that's that's one way that we miss the opportunity why self-pity i call this layering right we have this this basic thing that happens and instead of staying with this thing we start layering why me poor me what could i have done what oh i am no good oh i deserve it no i don't deserve this why instead of staying with this original thing okay i'm in pain in zen we basically momentarily fully accept where we are and we become that. I, I am heartbroken, I am heartbroken. I sit with that heartbrokenness, I let it be, I bring awareness to it and I transform it by allowing it. But the moment I start fighting it and repressing it, I, I've turned myself into my own enemy, right? Mm. <sighs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't want to go too far into the branches, uh, but I tend to do that because everything is connected, you know. It's great. It's great. We are just going to remind them of some questions because they, at the end, those questions are all probably really reflecting in uh, this simplicity that, that, that comes out of, of, uh, of your wisdom. 
one of it is uh, uh, the question was uh, from Eleonora. She is asking if she wanted to kind of practice the most more conscious sexuality or, or sacred sexuality, how we called it, in real life with the partner who is not conscious. So how does it work? Does it work if only one is uh, being more conscious about it? And what happens if another one, for example, is completely oblivious to any energies and does, you know, think this is all stupid or, you know, it doesn't exist? So can it happen one-sidedly or uh, what happens in those situations? One person is conscious of energies, conscious of the body, meditative and aware. The other one is maybe despising spirituality altogether in that word. You have to have a partner that is in tune with your, with your essence, right? If, if you are, are with someone who's completely out of tune with your essence, you're, you're punishing yourself. And, and, and you have to ask yourself, why, why have you put yourself in that situation? And for me, the fundamental thing is to really take responsibility for where we're at. Nobody is doing anything to us that we're not in some way allowed it. In, you know, in, in a way, for instance, uh, bringing you back to, to this beating that I received, at that moment, I, I was actually having very angry thoughts because I had organized a concert and the people who were supposed to help me screwed up and I had to do it. So I was having very angry thoughts when I got beat up. Does it have something to do? I don't know, but it's an important piece of information for me. And it, it is what I look at when anything happens to me is somehow I magnetize that experience to myself. If you're with a partner that's completely out of touch with who you are, how, how did you magnetize that situation to yourself? That's a fundamental question. Now, if the partner is a, is a loving partner that is kind of clued out in, in terms of that, we cannot, you know, we cannot, uh, what's the word in English, impose our ideas and opinions in, to someone else. And it works perfectly well for us to bring awareness and uh, sacredness within to our own se sexual relationship with this person without this person knowing it at all. And they will feel it. They will feel it and they will be affected in a positive way by, by that energy. But if you find that your sexual relationship is dissatisfying and, and it, it does not in any way meet your, your standards, my friend, <laughs> you know what to do about that, right? <laughs> what are you doing there? Mm -hmm. But, uh, and, and, you know, I, I've taught yoga for many years and I run a, a yoga school with a beautiful partner uh, who's a master yogi. And we found that after retreats, a lot of relationships broke up. You know, in a natural and loving way, where it's like, okay, you know, this is my path, and we're not in tune as far as that goes. So we have to let each other go. There's definitely a a, a great power in in sharing vision with your partner. This incredible power. However, you'll never be the same. You know, it, it's not the same. We definitely have lots of uh, differing points of view and, and we enjoy very much quote unquote fighting about them and we end up always laughing about it and we have an amazing love and respect for each other and uh, and that you know wouldn't it be boring if we all thought the same and did the same <laughs> this friction the friction is very important you know in this teaching of Gurdjieff in fact uh, this one year retreat that I did uh, the, the Gurdjieff tradition always puts a person within every group who is, whose job is to create friction. It's like a professional asshole, <laughs> basically. <laughs> and the job of the professional asshole is to step on your toes and see where your awareness is. <laughs> and that was amazing. <laughs> oh, right. What is the opportunity? Yeah. What is the opportunity? <laughs> Actually, I so want to have a session. We will have to have a session where we talk about Gurdjieff and that approach because hmm. It has been so, so fascinating to me. And I, it's very rare to find somebody who has deeply been involved in that. So it's another question for another session. 
But just okay. a mental note, we have to bring it in. It's amazing how he says, okay, what's in uncomfortable, let's have that and see how <laughs> enlightened we are. Amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah so we have bella uh, asking so uh, in your opinion how about sexuality monogamy marriage and okay. other well else? monogamy versus multiple partners so literally uh you know what is your stance on that is uh, what, what is the uh what is the phenomenon of having one partner monogamy versus multiple partners my stance is simply that we are all individuals and we all have different needs and different modalities and whatever works for you may not work for me and uh, blessings on you, whatever you do, it's not my business who or how many you go to bed with. Uh, are you aware? Are you, are you loving? Your awareness will tell you if this is healthy for you or not. Personally, for me, there's nothing like monogamy. However, I, I have a confession to make. I've always acted monogamous. Well, almost, <laughs> almost always. I've screwed up, quote unquote, uh, more than one time. But I've always acted monogamous, but this is the first time with this beautiful woman that I am monogamous, that I really feel this uh, this beautiful commitment and connection with one person and I have no interest whatsoever and my energy doesn't go out and I find that wow profoundly blissful and joyful and nurturing and it's also you know it's dangerous is dangerous but that danger is beautiful it's dangerous because if I lose her for any reason she falls in love with someone else she has an accident whatever it's going to be really really hard on me but it's a beautiful danger, isn't it? <laughs> it's, it's like what we say about the garden. We cannot build walls around, around the garden. We have to let those storms come and, and go. So personally, I really, uh, I am thriving in, in total joy and bliss in this uh, state of monogamy. And I've always preferred monogamy because uh, I, I value quality over quantity, you know. And, and quality can only be uh, cultivated, uh, in my experience, exclusively, okay? I'm not, I, I'm not saying this is the truth in any way. In my experience, I cultivate depth with one, with one person energetically. Mm -hmm. I think that if I started, I went through, through a period of, of enjoying sex. I was, I was single, I was a musician, I was touring, and... Uh, all over the country and I had access to gorgeous women and I enjoyed that and I have still lots of beautiful friendships with a, with a lot of these lovers and uh, nothing wrong with that. But I cannot in any way compare that with, with, with this <laughs> in any way. <laughs> but we are all individuals. So whatever works for me may not work for you, you know? So don't, there, there's no book that will tell you there's no teacher that will tell you what is good for you. You have to know yourself by cultivating your awareness. <laughs> I'm not sure if she's laughing or approving. <laughs> is it approval or <laughs> at you? <laughs> no, I'm saying there is a teacher that can ah. tell you what's good for you. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, but for, for those of you who don't know my partner, she is a human design specialist and she really believes she can tell you what's good for you. <laughs> well, for, for, for that matter, uh, we, uh, our last uh, gathering was about relationships, yeah, beyond relationships. And one thing, guys, that we didn't manage to say last time because we, we ran out of time was that the a good point to do together for a relationship is to know each other also from you know perspective of astrology human design gene keys to see where your friction points will be so you're kind of not taking it too personally and understanding that your major difference might be actually your your highest point of connection and growth so um, <clears throat> uh, we we took a reading we, we are in the middle of reading of couple reading with uh, with Julia. With Julia. And 
it's uh, it's very revealing. So if you do have a partnership questions, uh, it's very good to find out about it upfront or confirm what you've already gone through. It's very, very useful. And it's a conscious approach to, to how to lead the relationship and build it uh, ever, ever stronger. Mm -hmm. So it's not like, like we didn't know anything about it, but it, when it was pointed to us in such an obvious and like, you know, word for word explanation, we were like, oh yeah, we see it actually cre clearer than before. Like Pepe says, it doesn't mean now we are going to, you know, drastically change the way that we do anything, but we will deeper have a deeper understanding of what is going on. So yeah, very, very uh, helpful and beautiful. And by the way, that's going to be part of our uh, beautiful group of uh, Club of Life facilitators. So it's going to be accessible to you guys really very, very easily. So uh, yeah, where are we? Have we answered most of the questions or uh, where are we right now? I hope we didn't. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> So, for example, the, the practices that you mentioned, uh, the ones that work for you, uh, do they come like undiluted from a specific tra tradition or uh, you have tweaked them in, in your own way, you mix and match what works for you? Yes, I confess I took, took them a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I've, I've had access to, to just pretty much every uh, tradition. Uh, Sufism, uh, yoga, Buddhism, uh, you name it. And, and I found that if I take this and that, I can make my own personal uh, practice. And uh, I've, I haven't seen a, a doctor for years. We just, had a, we just had a blood test done and the doctor said, I am strong as a bull. <laughs> I don't get sick, uh, so somehow it's working. So I have, you know, I, I am very much willing to share what I what I do without any uh, claim to truth. Uh, but uh, it has really worked for me. It has really worked for me. I am just about to turn sixty six, and I feel the best I've ever felt. So uh, something is working. <laughs> but yeah, I have uh, I have mixed from from many sources. So maybe you have, a, you have a space to share something that, that you're really excited about and what works for you and is easy enough uh, <clears throat> for everyone to implement. It could be... Uh, you mean right now? Yeah. Ah, right now. <laughs> well, uh, the key and, and the foundation of absolutely every practice is proper breathing. Breath is the key to everything. So uh, breathe, breathe properly. The, the yogic breath fills your tummy and then your chest. And then just take a, take a nice deep breath right now. And of course, your breath depends very much on your posture, right? So if you're all, you cannot breathe unless your, your posture, your breath and your posture are intimately connected and your breath will can tell you a lot about your posture and your posture will condition your breath. So get a nice posture and get a nice breath. And you know, quite often that'll be enough. That'll be enough because any stressful situation, any toxic situation will affect your breath immediately. And so if you go back to the foundation, which is your breath, and go back to deep breath, your perspective opens, your, your emotions come down, your mind becomes a little clearer. And so step number one, breathe. The, the, other, the other fundamental practice for me is mantra, mantra practice. Really, I find very uh, profound. Uh, do you know what NLP is? Maybe everybody knows what NLP is. And NLP is called anchoring. You, you anchor a certain emotion, a certain mental state to an action or to a word or something. And so the more you cultivate that anchoring, then that word becomes a, a trigger to trigger that, that state. And so mantra very much works that way. If you're all 
freaked out or, or, or dispersed or, or stressed and, and you cultivated the word OM, you say it once and it's like you immediately have reminded yourself to, oh, let's come back to our alignment. So uh, I have certain mantras that I, that I practice, OM Mani Padme Hum, OM, uh, from Buddhism, from different traditions that I have realized. Uh, and the realization comes from the alignment, right? If you say a mantra, for me, this three, three piece alignment is fundamental. In my head, what does it mean? What tradition does it come from? Why am I attracted to this mantra? In my heart, this sense of connection with the tradition, the sense of gratitude for these teachings, uh, a connection with whatever archetype this mantra is belongs to, whether it's Shiva or Buddha or whatever, and physical, my breathing, my, my posture. And so when I align these three things and I say my mantra, this alignment just, just happens. So that, that's very simple, something that I very much recommend. I'm always saying mantra. I'm cooking, I'm saying mantra. And uh, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful way of uh, returning to your, to your alignment. So yeah. breathe, breathe is number one. Learn how to breathe properly through whatever tradition attracts you. Yoga specializes very much in, in breathing techniques, but it's not about breathing techniques. These can be very useful, but it's about proper connection with the process of breathing. Because when you bring awareness to this process, you immediately can come to alignment just by reconnecting with your breathing, yes? Yeah. Yes, and thanks for reminding what the mantra connection really is, because sometimes, you know, people hear in kirtans and, uh, and they just repeat it because they've heard it somewhere. But this uh, importance of knowing which tradition, why, and what, you know, what it means for you. And I remember in one of your uh, uh, concerts, you shared how difficult it is to earn the mantra. I was fascinated by that. Can you maybe bring it up? What it takes to embody truly a mantra? Well, uh, according to the Buddhist tradition, which is mostly my, my foundation, uh, after your initiation into the mantra, you say it several hundred thousand times. Uh, and they give you that Buddhists love numbers. And, you know, I don't take the numbers too seriously, but the idea that this repetition has to happen many hundred thousand times. Also, in the Buddhist tradition, we were taught how to, um, to do the Buddhism. Prostrations. Thank you. Prostrations. And also several hundred thousand prostrations that left my knees in shambles. <laughs> but it was an amazing for us Westerners to really prostrate. It's like, wow, it's a real challenge to our, to our ego, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, so it was an amazing um, discipline, discipline for me. However, however, I want to make a, a distinction here because there's the fundamentalist mantra theory and the fundamentalist mantra theory is like, you have to pronounce it perfectly. You have to be initiated by a teacher who has a tradition behind them, who has also been initiated. And if these things don't happen, a piano will fall on your head, right? <laughs> and this, this I'm, I'm, I don't subscribe to that. I think if you, uh, your intention is deep and your intention is pure, wow. I brought the word pure. <laughs> if you're really sincere uh, and you practice a mantra from a book, you will get results. You will get results. Uh, I, I have some mantras that I have learned directly from teachers and I have been sort of initiated into them. And I have other that have attracted me and I just practice them from a book and I find them I cannot say they're equally powerful, but but I find them all extremely uh, powerful and uh, dynamic and uh, helpful. So uh, don't be afraid by the fundamentalist point of view that you need to be in a tradition and be initiated and blah 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 blah. You know, just practice with sincerity. That's all it takes. And hundred. Hundred thousand of uh, first, first. <laughs> hundred thousand times. <laughs> the, the, the mala is a, is a beautiful object uh, from a shamanic perspective. Is what they call a power object. You you really uh, 
put energy into this uh, object and this object starts really feeding you back this energy. It's like an energetic bank, a power object. And the mala is beautiful because it gives you a measure. You do one, two malas and you have, make a commitment and then you know how many mantras you've done and you've put the energy of the mantra into the mala. So after a few months or years, just holding the mala really gives you back this, this energy. It's a, it's a beautiful object. So I love my malas. Uh, I hope everybody knows what a mala is, you know, the, the beats that you use to count uh, mantras. That's the purpose of these, uh, of these beats. So, uh, In Catholic tradition, rosaries. So, yeah. The yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, so th this is this is amazing, Pepe. You uh, you answered uh, the question about uh, sacred sexuality by completely <laughs> flattening the topic. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. My apologies. <laughs> <laughs> and giving the life philosophy instead. So yeah. it's 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 amazing because this is what ultimately it is. You answered from the highest point possible. So you see, nobody has any more questions because it's all clear awareness. <laughs> presence breathe and enjoy life and, and trust trust and trust life everything as a as a beautiful uh, opportunity and it's everything is sacred yeah how however <laughs> uh, we we spoke with you about um you know deepening this awareness by going through a process of um how you said the the uh, sacred sexuality and the rainbow body by uh, bringing awareness into every part of body reconnecting with every single energy center that we have uh, bringing light love and awareness into every single one of them could you and this is the open invitation to um, to all of you as well to to, to join we will make a little we'll make a program in, yeah. a, in a in two hours of course it's so we'll make program. a six-week program that actually deals practically with sacred sexuality and with uh, actually using and, and and learning about those energies and what they mean for different parts of our body with guidance of Pepe, of mm -hmm. course so, so and can you give a, a little word of uh, what uh, what this kind of awareness can bring into into our lives. You asked me, you know, if I mix things and I, and I do mix things and I'm very, very happy and, and confident that these things can, can really add to, to the quality of your life. So I'm very happy to, without calling myself in any way a teacher, to really share my, my, my experience. And uh, the, the, the way we thought about sharing this is in an extremely practical, practical way. And uh, we're going to use the, the um, structure of the chakra system without uh, saying that this is in any way the truth. I mean, awareness that there's many chakra systems, nine, seven, five, three, twelve, hundreds. Uh, so none of them is the truth. They're simply systems that allow us to see things in a very systematic way and act in a systematic way. So we're going to use the, the kind of the psychological attributions uh, that are fairly modern of the chakras and, and work in very practical ways to each center and how to enhance and, and kind of um, cleanse the centers. So to give you an, an example, for instance, uh, your third chakra is uh, psychologically related to your personal power and your personal will. So what are the activities, meditations uh, that can really help enhance that, that sense of your personal power. Your first chakra is your grounding, your security, your sense of belonging. What are the practices that can give you access to, to really develop uh, these things? And how does any of that relate to sexuality? Very much, right? I mean, your sense of power, Sexually, sexual energy has so much power and, and it's a sharing of that power. How are you sharing that power with your, how are you enhancing that power with your, with your partner? First chakra, foundational, right? Your sense of belonging together. How can you enhance that? Your, your comfort with your own <clears throat> uh, 
presence in your body that all belongs to the first chakra, et cetera, et cetera. And so we're going to look into, into practices that I have found uh, very useful to, to enhance and develop uh, that awareness. And uh, we're going to have fun and we're going to make it very practical. And, so and this, uh, right? And, and, some, and what? And you will include some music? Absolutely. Sound, sound healing is a, f a fundamental part of, of, of my practice. And, and uh, I, I started playing guitar when I was seven years old. So I have a very deep connection. And eventually my so-called spiritual practice with my musical practice uh, blended together. And I use a lot of sound. Uh, so we're going to mostly, since uh, not necessarily everybody here will have an instrument, we'll use vocal uh, sounds and, and mantra uh, to work on these things. Fantastic. Yeah, amazing. We have two wow. professional musicians in the group, so it's going to be nice. so cool. like a flute nice. player and we have hey. a, a trumpet player. Okay, we, we can do some, some Zoom sound healing. And, and, yeah. uh, and here. <laughs> yes, here's Angela, the, the trumpet player, and uh, everything else, shamanic. And amazing. I wrote you pa paper by uh, Facebook. So. Acha, okay. I think you will hear, you will see. Great, thank you. Oka is uh, the flute player of, of classical music. Uh, and then we have sound healers. Uh, yes. and. Uh, and amazingly creative uh, other talents. Ah, also a violinist. Ah, amazing. Ah, beautiful <laughs> musicians. Wow, so, so cool. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So, uh, so well, we will uh, send you guys more info about this training program. We think it's really amazing. And we think that this is actually how we actually work with sexual energies without falling in those traps that are lurking all over and uh, kind of trying to attract us to whatever mm -hmm. somebody thinks is right. So, yeah, it's, it's bringing the experience to yourself and uh, giving you the tools and uh, safe space so that you can discover what is your connection to your body, mm -hmm. your sexuality and your way of, of being. So that's how we will learn in this, uh, let's say new stage of uh, planetary open awareness uh, we'll learn from our own direct experience and craft it from the ingredients, you know, that we can bring um, uh, on the table. Mm -hmm. So and hopefully uh, have very, some... very grateful Pepe, that you <laughs> remember that it's that Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> it was a bit of a panic. <laughs> but it's so cool because it is so learning as detachment and this is exactly what you mean. It can be beautiful this or that way and if it's right it will happen and obviously it was right. It so, was right. So <laughs> it's so cool. So All thank right, you so friends. much. Hasta luego. Uh, see you guys. Hasta and, luego. Thank you. Thank you. And Pepe, because I think you can't read the comments, just saying that uh, Bella says that, uh, that your your sharing was like a bomb for the soul. Thank you oh, very much. Oh, thank you. I agree <laughs> and I join in with these words. It was yes. bomb for the soul. Thank yeah. you. All right. <laughs> Hasta luego. Thank you. Hasta luego. Hasta luego. Gracias. Hasta luego. Bye. 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 Bye.